Coming up next, why God gave specific word picture assignments to the man called Abraham. A question surrounding the birth of Ishmael. And where exactly is Mount Moriah? All of this and more coming up on Quick Study. Stay there. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Rod Hembry. I'm Janice. And I'm Corey. And this is the Quick Study Television Program, a program designed to take you through the Bible in one year. Yes, it's true. That book that's been sitting on your shelf for all those years has daily truths to live by. And we'll be talking about that today as we focus on a specific time in the life of the man called Abraham. As a matter of fact, if you have your Quick Study Pocket Guide, we'll be studying Genesis chapter 15 to 17. And this man Abraham is an interesting guy. God promises him a son, talks to him very candidly. He has the opportunity to negotiate for the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. This is a really interesting passage of Scripture. On Bible archaeology, what are we studying? We are going to be tracking down or attempting to track down the location of Mount Moriah that shows up in Genesis, shows up in the life of Abraham. Somewhat controversial. A little bit. But I happen to agree with Corey. Anyway, uh, let's go to the Bible IQ question, which is... How old was Abram when Hagar gave birth to Ishmael? 75 86 or 99. And every single one of those ages is over the national retirement limit. It is indeed. So that's very interesting. So we are dealing with this family of Abraham, and in all of this, we can discover truths to live by where we are with what we have today. That's what Quick Study is all about. So stay there as we continue. True enough. The first five books of the Bible are called the Pentateuch, which is a Latin word meaning the five. It is also called the Torah, meaning the law by those in the Jewish faith. The first five books of the Bible were organized by Moses as God's record of humanity and his interaction with it and creation of it. Genesis is just as much an official family record of early man as it is a record of God's interaction with specific people. The Bible always has been and remains an official record carefully preserved in full public view. Chapter 14, Abram is promised a son by God. And that, of course, comes after Abraham's heartfelt plea. He didn't have any children that his, his property would go to after he died. He only had a head servant of his household. And he didn't necessarily want to pass on all of his possessions to his servant because then his family lineage would not carry on. But God promises him a son. Well, little did Abram know that in a little while after he had been given this son, he would be expected to go through this test where he has to be willing to give up his son, to lose his son to death. And of course, he doesn't. God saves his son, Isaac, but Abram doesn't know this. Now, where this test, that test of him being able to lose his son, takes place is in a mountain range that the Bible here in Genesis calls Moriah, the area of Moriah. So check this out. According to tradition and biblical interpretation, the Temple Mount, Mount Moriah, is the same mountain that Abraham brought Isaac to in Genesis 22. This was when he was willing to sacrifice Isaac, his only son. 
Some people are not willing to put their full support behind the idea of Mount Moriah being the same location. This is because in Genesis 22, Moriah is referred to as a region where Abraham was to take Isaac to one of the mountains. Suddenly, it seems less likely that Abraham would have picked the exact same mountain that later would be so famous and controversial. But is it unlikely, or is it just the beginning of a rich history? Later on, in that same chapter, Genesis 22, Abraham names the place the Lord will provide. And from then on, it is called the Mountain of the Lord. That same terminology is used throughout the Bible to refer to the Temple Mount. Also, the elements of Abraham's story match with the Jerusalem location. For example, how long the walk was. So, do we know that it is the exact same mountain? No, but there is no real reason to doubt it. Putting Genesis chapter 15 to 17 in context through truth text, Genesis 15, after being baptized into the reality of inter-kingdom wars and nations raging against each other, Abram is comforted by God as his shield and his reward. But the external threats would be no match for the internal temptation to solve the problems of family man's way. We'll study that. The desire of Abram to have a son and his great mistakes and how to get that son are recorded in chapter 16. Abraham's family is attacked by his own ideas instead of God's. And chapter 17 brings a sign of the covenant in flesh with the introduction of circumcision. Genesis 15, verses 1 through 11. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. But Abram said, Lord God, what will you give me, seeing I go childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus? Then Abram said, Look, you have given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This one shall not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. Then he brought him outside and said, Look now toward heaven, and count the stars if you are able to number them. And he said to him, So shall your descendants be. And he believed in the Lord, and he accounted it to him for righteousness. Then he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to inherit it. And he said, Lord God, how shall I know that I will inherit it? So he said to him, Bring me a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. Then he brought all these to him and cut them in two down the middle, and placed each piece opposite the other, but he did not cut the birds in two. And when the vultures came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. Genesis chapter 15, verses 1 through 11. I will tell you, we are learning so much as we go through the Bible, particularly, we're only 15 chapters in, and today we study something interesting, the stars. The stars at the time of Abraham represented anything except God's promises. They represented the starry hosts that were worshipped. They were used to represent demonic pagan gods, according to what the Bible says, of the ancient world. Now, when God called Abram to look out the night sky and count the stars, it must have been a serious leap of faith for this guy to take this in promise. But the God of the Bible was reclaiming the mind of Abram, something that we need to let him do when, our, when we come to him in our society today. Look at the stars and count the blessings of Abraham's future. This was the way of making right the faith of Abraham in the one true God, not in the gods of the starry host. Now, one of the things that I love about the passage we're going to read today 
is often underplayed. Most of the time, the Bible, the Word of God, is called the sword of the Spirit. And that's true. Paul calls it the sword of the Spirit, and it's often referred to the sword. But did you know that the Bible is also a shield? It's true. Now, in the Ephesians 6 chapter in the New Testament of the Bible, Paul puts together from a Roman centurion the if you would, armor of the Lord. And he calls the shield, the shield of faith. But Paul also said in Romans chapter 10, faith comes by hearing, and hearing is the word of God. Now in the book of Deuteronomy, it says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. So, if we want to grow our faith, we have to grow our faith by digesting and studying and making serious study of the Word of God. That's what will grow our faith. Now that's important in this world of fix-me-ups and pill-popping faith ideas. You just take a pill or give this offering and your faith will increase. Just take a step of faith. Well, no. God says, grow your faith. Grow your faith. Every time Jesus talked about faith, it wasn't in some kind of magical mystery thing. It was faith like a mustard seed to grow into a big plant. Very interesting. Now, let's come back to today's passage in Genesis 15. Here is a truth to live by that we learn from this great discipleship of Abraham. Check it out. The promise to the believer, that is somebody who's given themselves to Jesus Christ as Lord, the promise to the believer is that God is a shield and a reward. Now, a lot of people, they think God is only up there like a big God in the sky, just a, a big vending machine. You put in your little offering and you get out some big blessing. That couldn't be any further from the truth. Here we see in chapter 15, verse 1, after these things, the word of the Lord, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. He said, listen to these words, fear not. He was telling that to the disciples too. Fear not, I, Abraham, am your shield. Now understand the context which he's bringing this. Abraham's out there in a desert with all these people around him, don't believe in God and think he's crazy. I am your shield. God says to him. And then he says, I am your reward. But the shield first. It's important for us to remember as beloved, as we study God's word, as we get closer to him, as we become his disciples, he builds a shield to help us not be influenced by the darkness of this world. He's a shield. His word is a shield as well as a sword. Very important. But I have to tell you, I am intrigued, of course, by this whole starry night, God using the sky as an example. I wouldn't be surprised if the Creator at the beginning of time said to the angels, hey, let's make a universe full of stars so that one day I will be able to show to my servant Abraham the stars as an example. I wouldn't be surprised. But here's word to the wise, or I should say, truth to live by number two. The starry night reminds the believer of just how vast God's kingdom is. You're not alone. Now, if you feel like you're the only one who serves God, I have good news for you. You're not alone. In chapter 15, verse 2, it says, But Abram said, O Lord, what will you give me? For I continue childless, for my heir of my house is Eliezer, my servant. And Abram said, Behold, you have given me no offspring. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him and said, This man shall not be your heir your son. He brought him outside. Look at the heavens. Look at the stars now. He says, now look, see those people? By faith, I'm going to make those people be blessed by your family and part of your family. That's intense. So when the believer then goes outside to look at the stars when there's no clouds and it's not snowing, understand that that's how vast the church is. It stretches across time and space. That God has built his church and continues to do so and will not be defeated or put down. God is holy and truth to live by, number three. The power of God's promises in our lives depends upon our belief in Him. Do we really believe God for who He is? What struck me about this passage, you know, when you read it, it's just three words, and He believed. But you know, those three words change the course of Abraham's entire life also the life of his children, also the life of you and me. And he believed. If, if there were something at the Lord Terry's I wanted to have on my gravestone that my kids would remember, it would be, and dad believed 
God. reports that the family, husband and wife, daughter and son, is God's idea. To have husband and wife guiding and protecting children is an institution from the divine mind, not the contrivance of man's society. The original Hebrew term for wife is synonymous with woman, but the idea is that the wife is the guard of the family or the rear guard of the husband. The husband cannot grow the family properly without the wife, and the wife cannot protect the family well without the husband. In the Bible, marriage was complementive, not competitive. absolutely full of symbolisms and patterns and parallelism, all these different ways to try to teach us and help us to remember the Word of God. Now, you and I right now are going to explore a very interesting pattern. Many scholars and lay people have become absorbed in studying creation as recorded in Genesis 1. It is obvious that the record does reflect seven literal days by the counting of evenings and mornings. What is less obvious is the reason for the underlying pattern of the creation account. During the first three days, God creates the system of time by creating day and night, the systems for all weather and breathable air by separating the waters, and he prepares the way for sustainable life by making dry land, seas, and vegetation. During the next three days, days four through six, God seems to follow a similar pattern. First, building a solar system to keep time. Secondly, filling the waters and air with creatures. And thirdly, filling the dry land with creatures and humans. The pattern builds up to the moment when God installs human beings on earth. But what does this pattern point to? There could be an ancient parallel seen in the process of temple building. Temples were often viewed as representations of the world. Earth and seas, skies and heavens, vegetation and even wind could be portrayed in the decoration of the structure. The ancients would go so far as organizing the layout of the temple based on their understanding of the layout of the universe. The furniture, utensils, and worship could also be incorporated. We do know that the Tabernacle of Moses and Temple of Solomon were both seen as being symbolic shadows of things in heaven. There is also a tradition that sees the tabernacle representing the physical earth. So the question is, why is there an ancient idea that links the temple, the universe, and heaven? Could the universe have been arranged to represent the workings or layout of heaven? Join Janice, Corey, and Rod Hembry live every Sunday night at 8.30 p.m. for the Bible Investigators Program. We take your questions from Facebook, from Twitter, and also from the chat room about God, the Bible, and the church. Study for Truth with God's Word, Sunday nights live at Bible Investigators. That's BibleDiscoveryTV.com, 8.30 p.m. Eastern on Bible Investigators. Join us. This 
is the Quick Study Television. Thank you for watching Quick Study Television today, and we encourage you to read through the Bible with us. I invite you to pray about supporting Quick Study TV and to write for your own personal Quick Study Pocket Guide. This beautiful color guide will lead you through the Bible in one year to help you develop your personal encounters with God. For a gift in any amount, we'll automatically send it to you every month. Write to P.O. Box 150, Marysville, Pennsylvania, 15668-0150. Or in Canada, write to P.O. Box 456, Orangeville, Ontario, L9W5G2. Here's some amazing truth about what we've studied today. Abram's hometown was likely Ur of Chaldees, an ancient city in modern-day Iraq, in which the god Zin was worshipped. Now, that god's sign was a crescent moon with a star in it. Notice, however, that God told Abraham to count the stars and not look at the moon in articulating God's promise of a son. Abram's faith was being personally rewritten by God himself as he spoke to him day unto day and as Psalm 19 says, night unto night. Very interesting. And again, I come back to these parallels in the Bible. You know, you think of Psalm 19 and it all works together. But uh, what I was saying and what I was explaining here is fascinating that in ancient times, Corey, Men and women worshipped the stars as gods. They did. They, they actually, the stars were a huge part of the ancient life. It helped you tell seasons, helped you tell time, helped you tell direction. But what they did in the pagan religions is they gave personifications to almost every physical attribute of the world. So they would name a star and worship the star as a god. Mm -hmm. So Janice, the important thing here is to remember that the promise of Abraham wasn't simply a promise of personal personal prestige wasn't simply a promise of personal covenant of the land. It was much more than mm -hmm. that. It was those things, but it was more than that. It was because Abram's uh, uh, ancient uh, history and his culture worshipped the stars. It would have been a strange, what do you mean count the stars? I mean, there's that God, that God, that God. But God was saying, I am not subject to the gods. They are subject to me. And Abram, nor will you be subject to the demonic gods they will be subject to you. Mm -hmm. So here in the promised covenant of Abraham, we have a promise of dominion over evil. Mm -hmm. Now that to me is fascinating. It and is. we're watching the discipleship, Janice, of Abraham. Of Abraham, yes. God's personally discipling him. Isn't that amazing? I mean, it's stunning. And that's what God does to us. So he we does. need to pay attention mm -hmm. we do. to the details of the scripture. And speaking of paying attention, uh, the Bible IQ questions coming up, which I call now and this year the Bible challenge. Here we go. You ready, Corey? Here's ready. your challenge. Right, challenge. How old was Abram when Hagar gave birth to Ishmael? Was he 75, 86, or 99? That's a good question. All of them are above the... By the way, if, if uh, Abram was here today, he could eat in the seniors menu in the restaurants because all of those ages are older. Corey, what do you think? I think 86. I think. I not, totally agree with you. I think it's 86. I totally agree with Corey. I think he was 86, and, and you can actually do that by doing some backward math. Yes, that's actually <laughs> you, what I did. Could. And that's not cheating. That's no, not it's cheating. Not, it's knowing no. your Bible. You don't, how right. can you cheat? It's an open book test <laughs> right. there you for go. most people except me. It's an open book test. So Genesis 16, verse 16 says that he was 86 years old. Now that's pretty old. It is. Uh, but, but nothing is impossible elderly. with God. Of course not. Nothing is impossible with God, and uh, that's very, very interesting. By the way, interesting <laughs> dynamic there with Hagar yes. and her son, Ishmael. Yeah. God does not abandon her or her son. In fact, promises are made to Hagar, covenant promises about her son, Ishmael. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. All right, we have a passage of meditation yes. in the Mining Knowledge segment. So it's important that we meditate, to meditate on the scriptures, to think about over and over again, and to get it in our mind. I call that minding knowledge. Get it in your mind. Peter says, add to your faith what? Knowledge and virtue and so on. All right, here we go. So what is today's scripture? Today's scripture is Genesis 15, verse 5. Then he brought him outside and said, look now toward heaven, Abraham, and count the stars if you are able to number them. And he said to him, so shall your descendants be. I learned 
actually, if you think about this for a moment, Janice, the stars, only God is able to number the stars. So it's not that the stars are infinite. That's not what this passage means. So keep that in mind. God, the, the universe is finite. Mm -hmm. But from God's perspective is the only way that you will know the answer. His word says he knows them by name. He calls them, I wonder what, see, <laughs> this, I mean, we name the stars, right? Like Alpha Centauri and all these things. I wonder what God's name <laughs> I, you know, I, and I, we won't get into this because I get people all excited. I don't even call the planet Jupiter, Jupiter. I don't, I call it Michael. <laughs> I name it after the Archangel Michael because Jupiter Japanese. protects the solar system. Uh, anyway, the Archangel. <laughs> All right, there you go. Well, anyway, that's, uh, that's it for Mining Knowledge, but we want you to pay attention to what's coming up. This is a very important part of the program. Uh, the first most important part is the reading of God's Word, which Janice does. But this is also the second most important part of the program, and that is praying. Now, these people have written into us, and we love them. They are partners. They are people who interact with us. And so I'm calling together all of our partners right now to take a moment as we cycle through these prayer requests. Will you agree with us for God to answer prayer in their lives and in yours? be absolutely honest with you there are people who have come to know Jesus Christ they've not made him Lord that's true uh, they feel like they prayed the sinner's prayer they feel like they've come to Christ but by not making him Lord you've come to Christ only because it feels good salvation and coming to Christ making him Lord is not a, a emotional catharsis much more than that it's a change of the mind repentance means to turn around and stop going the direction you're going in. I want to encourage you today to give 100% of your life to Jesus. It requires a commitment on your part, but more than that, it requires a surrender on all of our parts. We surrender to Christ, and the difference between commitment and surrender is commitment I control, surrender God controls. Do you know Jesus? Have you surrendered to him? Pray and say, Lord, I surrender to you. I need you in my life. And if you're serious and you do surrender, he will change you. 